welcome to Your Sexual Revolution, the podcast. I'm your host, Amaya Shiva. I'm a scientist and Vedic practitioner turned sex and intimacy coach, and I help conscious men and women go from drained, frustrated, and suppressed in their sex lives to unstoppable in fulfilling their erotic desires and authentic expression. It is my mission to destigmatize sexual differences and preferences so that we can enjoy sex without fear or guilt or shame and enhance our pleasure and satisfaction in this human experience. I'm so excited that you're joining and I'm super excited for what I'm going to share with you today, which is the top five lessons I've learned about authentic sexual expression and how to heal sexual shame in the last 15 years of my studies. And I have been going deep, y'all. I am initiated into three tantric lineages. I have studied with masters from all over the world, from masters of meditation to dominatrixes. And these lessons if you really take them to heart, will completely transform the way you relate to your sexuality and to other people. So stay tuned because this is juicy. Okay, so I want you to take a moment to think about the first time you were taught that sex is bad and that sex is something to be ashamed about by people who were doing it. And one of the memories that I have is of going into my dad's bedroom and opening the door and he was in there with a girlfriend and they were doing something and I don't know exactly what, but they both jumped up and they're like, oh, shut the door. And I was like, oh my God. And so I ran out, I shut the door, my heart was pumping and I was scared. I like, I had done something really bad by witnessing this, right? I had done something really bad by witnessing their sexual activity. And so I needed to get kicked out of the room. I know I'm not the only one who's had this kind of experience. And I know I internalized it and received a very confusing message because I received the message that people have sex, but when they do, or when they are being intimate, it's something to be hidden and ashamed of, even though everybody's doing it for the most part. So isn't that an interesting introduction to sexuality? And most of us had something like that. So many people I know have had experiences of walking in on their parents. And, and I'm curious for those of you who are parents and are listening, how do you respond or react when somebody, when your kids walk in and see you having sex or catch a glimpse of something like, are you calm about it? Or do you also freak out? Because that's what somebody taught you. And so our first impressions are really shaping our sexual attitudes and how we understand sexuality and how we express it or don't. And I'm so passionate about this work because sexual trauma is rampant in this culture and sex is ubiquitous. Like we need sex to exist, yet we're shamed for it. You are, you have been shamed for your biology from your culture, your parents and your society. And maybe not for all of you, but for many of us, that has been the case. And so we are here to reclaim that and reclaim what it means to be expressed in, in your sexuality, not anybody else's. And the first lesson I'm so excited to share with you is that your sexuality is as unique as your taste in clothes and your taste in music, and you don't have to justify it to anybody. So most of our first impressions of sexuality come from one of two places. It's people or three. Uh, it's somebody in the home, right? It's parents, it's siblings, and it's movies or it's peers, right? These are the, the places in the home environment, school, and Hollywood. That's what's teaching us about sex. And there's this very basic kind of format that we're taught, which is somebody likes somebody, then maybe they make out, then maybe they have sex. And then when the man has an orgasm, sex is over. And 
until recently, and even now it's pretty suppressed, there wasn't a lot of information or examples of people doing it differently. Like how many love stories have you seen with, uh, with homosexual actors as, as the leads where, where, you know, something outside of heteronormative culture was leading the way or, um, how many, um, how many movies have you seen where, um, you know, the only people doing kinky things were like total freaks who were not grounded in, in their lives and, you know, not stable people. Like, I mean, you actually, you can be kinky and stable as fuck and kinky as fuck. Those can go together, but we're not taught that. And so for some people, you know, you're not going to love having penetrative sex for other people. You're, that's all you're going to think about depending on your erotic blueprint. Um, and there's no shame in that. And I really want to invite that whatever your unique expression of sexuality is, there are people willing to meet you there and you do not have to pretend to be something you are not. Mm, I hope that's landing. And this segues perfectly into the second lesson, which I think was probably the most radical in transforming my own sex life and amplifying the pleasure that I experience with other humans. I mean, at least a thousand fold. That's how impactful this principle was. Um, and how it shattered these subconscious narratives I had been carrying for most of my adult sexual life. So background of this breakthrough, I was at a retreat with 50 other divine souls that were all there to uncover and heal aspects of our sexuality. And we were pretty, a pretty close knit group. And, um, it was the first time, I think it was like three or four days in, uh, it was one of the first times that I felt fully comfortable walking around semi nude or nude uh, with people because they all knew that it wasn't a sexual invitation. And it was a place where I started to really feel free to be liberated without fear that somebody was going to want something from me, without fear that somebody was going to expect something from me. Because a subtle narrative I have been carrying for much of my life is that if I turn someone else on, I am responsible for their turn on. And that happens all the time, the way we, we slut shame women, or there's this underlying narrative, like she was asking for it. That's where that comes from, that there's a subtle message or not so subtle being taught to you that if you're sexy and something happens to you, it's your fault. And that's a terrifying narrative to carry for women. And the breakthrough that I had was that I am not responsible for other people's pleasure. And the only person's pleasure I am responsible for is my own. See, I had spent so many years scared of being too sexy, not only because of the fear of sexual assault, but because of bullying from other women who were insecure. Uh, there's also a narrative in our culture that you're allowed to say negative things about a woman who is expressed in her sexuality, right? And notice where you have done this. I, I did this when I was younger. I know I did. And I'm so sorry for that. And I want to own that. And this is an invitation to do it better, to do it different, to stop doing this. Um, in this process of remembering that I am not responsible for other people's pleasure, all these instances in my life flashed before my eyes. Like I remember this boyfriend I had in my 20s. I don't think I ever liked having sex with him. And I dated him for three years three years. And I don't, I'd never had an orgasm from having sex with him. I'd only do it when I was drunk. You know, this is my early twenties. I was not the healthiest person. Um, and I still was caring that I had to do that. It was my responsibility. Um, it was, it was up to me and that my pleasure didn't matter. 
And of course, we're all operating with mirror neurons. And if somebody isn't enjoying an experience, you're also not going to enjoy it as much, whether you're aware of it or not. So all these doors got opened and I got so clear that other people's pleasure is not my responsibility. And it is my responsibility to be so in tune with my fuck yes and my fuck no. That at any instant, if I start to go into the fuck no, I get to communicate that because most people don't want to be engaged with somebody who isn't a fuck yes to what they're doing. Yet it happens all the time. Uh, mm. I was at a dance hall that I go to regularly the other night and this guy who I know through the community came up to me because he knows about the work I do. And he said, Hey, Maya, I have a question for you. Um, I had this thing happen the other night and I'm a little confused about what was going on. And I was like, well, of course, yeah, please ask if I can help you. I'd be happy to. He said, well, I was with this woman and, uh, we started having sex and then she just was like laying there. She wasn't moving. She wasn't into it. And I kept asking her if she was okay and if she wanted to be doing it. And she said, yeah. Um, but like, it just, it didn't feel good. It didn't feel right. And, you know, this kind of stuff happens all the time. And, and I asked him, I said, well, did it feel good to you? And he said, well, no, not really. And I said, yeah, I get that. Um, I'm curious, why didn't you stop? And he paused for a moment and I could see him really thinking about it. And he's like, well, you know, I guess I, I, I didn't want to hurt her feelings. And, and I said, well, is it possible that she was having the same experience? Because I promise you, if somebody isn't moving, if they're just laying there, they're not enjoying it. And they're either in a fawn or a freeze response, which I'm going to go into uh, in another episode. So please stay tuned and subscribe uh, if you haven't already. Um, and, you know, it, it hit him that that probably was what happened. And he got so sad because he doesn't want to do that to anybody. He doesn't want to create a, an experience where somebody is engaged in sex that they don't want to be engaged in. And, you know, they were both doing it, both parties. Like the woman was saying, yeah, no, it's okay because of her conditioning and trauma potentially. And he was doing the same thing and both probably walked away feeling like shit. I know he did because he's a really sensitive, kind human and he, he didn't want to do that. So, um, when you don't share your true experience with people, you put them at risk of of being the cause of something they don't want to be the cause of. And that's not fair. That's deception. I have another friend uh, who, whose wife, now ex-wife, revealed to him that she was, in fact, a lesbian and she never enjoyed having sex with him. And that completely fucked him up. That completely fucked him up. And because now he's thinking like about all these situations in which he was having sex with her, thinking she enjoyed it and how it wasn't true. And it and then he's he started to doubt all of his other experiences as well and carried this trauma forward. So the reason that we're honest and that we tell people what we're actually experience what we are experiencing is not just for us. It's for them and for their next partners and for the people all down the line. And if you've, and if you've been there in a situation where you've frozen or fawned, I'm not shaming you. I have done that a numerous times. I'm here to invite and remind you that there's a different way to do it and I'm going to help you get there. So stay with me. So this brings me to the next very important lesson and where I learned this lesson was um, when I first started going to Tantra festivals, I like, I got pretty serious about it. I was like, yo, like I have been carrying this sexual shame and trauma. I'm tired of it. I'm going to go to all the things that are taboo and figure out what is going on. So I think I went to like 30 play parties in one year and I didn't have sex at them. You don't have to do that at a play party, but I did learn a lot and then I saw so much. I saw people doing different things and I was so fascinated by it. And some of it, I was like, wow, I would never do that. And uh, 
the one of my favorite facilitators and now dear friends major um who in my opinion is one of the best facilitators for conscious play parties that i've ever experienced and probably in the world um, has this beautiful way of setting a container where uh, before we begin we all come together and we talk about boundaries consent agreements about being able to say no at any time about how no is a complete sentence and about how lesson number three don't yuck other people's yum isn't that a great lesson you know we live in a in a culture i know i was brought up to be critical or judgmental of people who did things differently, even though I grew up in like a, an open-minded family, but I say that because everybody's got their biases. And this is so true because it's, if you don't like it, don't do it and walk away. Because when you do say things and you shame people, they start to internalize that they're bad and that something's wrong with them and that they don't deserve love and that they need to hide themselves. And in my opinion, this is the foundation of all unhealthy sexual acts like sexual violence, sexual, sexual molestation, uh, um, child pornography. I think a lot of this comes from people who who have suppressed what they desire. They don't have a healthy outlet for it. So they go the sneaky route. Because remember at the beginning, how we're taught from a very young age that sex is something to be hidden, yet everybody's doing it. And so th there's just all these confusing signals. And, and I really believe this is the root of sexual dysfunction and that most people who are sexually dysfunctional are so because they were abused or and they don't have a healthy outlet for their sexual expression. So let's practice being curious. Like if you don't like something and somebody says they want to do that, you can simply say, um, I'm, you know, I'm a no to that, but thank you for sharing your desire with me. Like what a mature way to interact with other people and to respect where they are. So lesson number three, don't yuck other people's yum. This brings me into lesson number four, which I've actually touched on quite a few times, but I want to state it very clearly. A lot of the sexual shame you're carrying isn't yours. You are not born with sexual shame. When little kids first discover they have genitals and it feels good to touch them, they are not feeling bad about it. The reason they learn that it's bad is because their parents yell at them. They say, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. That's bad. That's bad. Don't touch yourself. You know, that's dirty. And so they become ashamed of their biology. And what a powerful weapon that is for control. Because people who are confident in who they are and in their self-expression don't care what other people think. And that's dangerous, right? versus people who have internalized that something is wrong with them and that something is bad, they're going to do a lot more to conform and to fit into culture and society because on some level, a part of them is making up for their inherent badness, their inherently flawed nature. And this is a really interesting topic that I've learned about from, from a book called Healing the Shame That Binds You. And I recommend that to anybody who wants to heal sexual shame or any kind of shame or trauma. You, you're not born with this. You're born with your sexual preferences. You can, and some you can adopt, but you, you are not born with sexual shame. That is learned. That is conditioned. So note that if you feel that, that doesn't come from you. That's from somebody else's story that they also learned this whole generational cycle of trauma. And that brings me into lesson number five, which is that healing sexual shame is a revolutionary act and is a critical piece of your authentic expression on this earth. There's, there's a thing called healthy shame, which is when we accidentally hurt somebody's feelings or, you know, we accidentally make someone feel bad. You know, we're unintentionally insensitive. That's one thing. That's a healthy expression of shame. But, but to be ashamed of your biology is crazy pants, <laughs> to put it in scientific terms. 
When you can tap into your own authentic desires, which comes with a whole slew of beautiful skills, including learning how to communicate your boundaries, learning how to communicate your desires, learning how to give feedback and receive feedback. It's a, it's a very emotionally maturing process and a very beautiful one. You unlock incredible pleasure, incredible experiences, because when you heal the sexual shame, when you get so clear on your boundaries and desires, you can actually relax into the experience. And um, stay tuned, come back, because in, in one of my next episodes, I'm going to be talking about how we create those frameworks. Um, but I'd also like to, you know, share a story that like very recently, I went on a date with somebody and he was just visiting town and, and like we knew that there wasn't, we knew that there wasn't potential for long term. And so that for me really changes how I interact with someone. Like I'm not going to sleep with you because for me, I get very emotionally attached from penetrative intercourse. And so, you know, it was one of the most powerful conversations I've had. And, and I'm going to share this with you because I want it to inspire you. But we, we met you know, for our first date and had a walk and it was really lovely. And we connected and talked about magic and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and then at the end I said, well, you know, I'd be open for an encounter with you, but here's how I want it to be. Uh, I don't actually want to kiss you or make out and I don't want any genital touch or penetration. I'm open to skin contact. I'm open to massage. I'm open to sensual touch, but with underwear on and like this, right? And, and it, you know, it was one of the first times I had been so direct with somebody I didn't know well, and it, it felt edgy and it felt really good too, because it was my honest, authentic expression and desire. And he responded. He was like, yeah, I'm down for that. And the feedback that I got was that it was so hot for him because the boundaries were so clear and there, there was no confusion. So both parties got to know exactly what the parameters were. And we both got to negotiate because uh, sex is a negotiation between two people. And um, when you get to that place where you're so safe and you're so confident in yourself and your desires and what you are worthy of all these different levels just unlock for you. And you start to think about all the ways in which you fucking, you've been doing shit you didn't want to. And not just in your sex life, in all areas of your life. And you probably didn't have, you probably just could have communicated in a different way and had your needs met in a different way. So I invite you to consider the incredible possibility that is waiting for you on the other side of healing the shame. You're healing not only your own shame and trauma, but you're healing generational and cultural shame and trauma that needs to be eradicated so that we can focus on things that really matter, like authentic connection, um, healing mother earth, living in communities in a healthy way. This is a foundational piece of that. I want to thank you so much for spending this time with me. And if you found it useful, I'd love for you to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. Please share this podcast with anybody who would benefit from it. Now, we are here to create community. We are here to create positive change and to open people's minds and hearts to new possibilities and ways of being. And if you are somebody who would love deeper support on this path, uh, you can find me and inquire about one-on-one -on -one coaching at amayashiva.com. There's a booking link. It's very clear when you get to the page, or you can find me on Instagram at amayashiva. There are so many ways for us to connect, and I'm so excited to continue to support you on this journey of unfolding. Uh, stay tuned for my next episodes. Thank you so much for being here. You're incredible. Sending you all my love. This is your host, Amaya Shiva. Until we meet again.